Christ. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening and welcome to the British Residence. It's an honor to host the eighth annual Christopher Makin's Lecture, and it's a great pleasure to have such a distinguished audience here, so thank you all for coming. There is, of course, a strong family connection uh, in that Christopher's father, Sir Roger Makin's, was ambassador here from 1952 to 1956. And I checked today, there is a line of photographs of my predecessors in the corridor outside my office, and there he is. He's sort of seventh from the left on the second row. Um, he looks great, he looks very distinguished, but he stands out rather from the crowd of ambassadors around him, these photographs, because all the other ones in that particular part of the wall have really distinctive and extensive facial hair, whether <laughs> Lincoln-esque beards or large handlebar moustaches, and there's Christopher or Roger completely clean-shaven. I'm wondering actually what I should grow myself when I come to be photographed in that august company. <laughs> but moving on to Christopher, he was, of course, hugely successful in his own right. He followed in his father's footsteps initially in the UK Foreign Office, but quickly moved onwards and upwards uh, to Washington, where he had an exceptional career in the Carnegie and Aspen think tanks, and then became President of the United Council. You'll hear much more in a minute about him, but the Makin's Lecture is a fitting tribute to a life of considerable achievement. It's also a real pleasure to have here this evening someone who's actually a former boss of mine and a political powerhouse in the form of Sir Malcolm Rifkind. Sir Malcolm has had an extraordinary career in British politics. The next speaker will elaborate, but I'm going to give you a couple of personal anecdotes. Um, he was once described by a journalist, I think from The Telegraph, as the suave Scot with a sharp mind. And that's exactly how the Prime Minister of the day saw him. Margaret Thatcher, because he was elevated to the cabinet at only 39, and he rose almost to the very top of British politics, being both Defence Secretary from 1992 to 1995, and Foreign Secretary from 95 to 97. But he first made an impact, at least on me, as a junior minister in the Foreign Office in the early 1980s. Don't you have such creatures here in, in your system? But junior ministers in our system, are mainly used for two purposes. They do the parliamentary debates that take, a clock, take, take place at two o'clock in the morning. They're called adjournment debates, and it's always the junior minister's job to take that on. There's usually about three people in the House of Commons when they do it. And they deal with the parts of the world that the foreign secretary isn't interested in. And Malcolm was given the region which attracted the least enthusiasm of almost anywhere, what we Brits call the graveyard shift, which was the communist regimes in the early 80s of Central and Eastern Europe. These were a bunch, you'll remember, of really appalling people. Honecker in East Germany, Ceausescu in Romania, and so on. No one wanted to talk to them, because if you want to know what they thought, you'd go and ask Moscow, not them. But Malcolm actually created a new policy. We, he, would travel to these countries, he would talk to these terrible dictators, but each time he would also talk, or we would talk, to the dissidents. Famously, Solidarity in Poland, but there were distant groups in all of these states. This made him unpopular with the regimes. It led to protests. Sometimes he wasn't invited back. Sometimes it involved escapades. There's a story which may be apocryphal of Malcolm holding court with, I think it was the East German, but it may have been one of the other um, sets of ministers while a couple of his officials escaped through the bathroom window to go off and talk to some dissidents. <laughs> but it made a real impact. When the Warsaw Pact collapsed, it was striking and heartwarming how many of those dissidents who Malcolm and his team had cultivated and supported in those days subsequently, subsequently became leaders. I think it was a real contribution to what happened in Central Europe because it gave such encouragement to those future leaderships. Second observation, second anecdote, relates to Malcolm's time as Foreign Secretary. He was in the job through 
the Bosnia War and the Dayton Peace Settlement in 1995, and the deployment of the international force to Bosnia. It was one of, if not the busiest, biggest issues of the day. As it happens, uh, through my good fortune, I was head of the Balkan department at the time, and so I saw a lot of Malcolm. He was just terrific to work for. He was calm and unflappable, but most important of all for us officials, he was absolutely clear about what he wanted. And there is nothing, I tell you, more important for officials than to have that clarity. And he had a party trick which was much noticed, including by the journalists who covered the House of Commons. Once a month, there is an hour of Foreign Office questions when the Foreign Secretary stands at the dispatch box and takes questions from both sides of the House on literally anything, anything that's happening on the planet. There's a huge amount of briefing prepared for this. There's a voluminous folder that we give to the Foreign Secretary of the day with the answers to all potential questions that could conceivably be asked. And the truth about Malcolm is he never needed it. He would stand there at the dispatch box. He left his briefing folder on the bench behind him. He used to be in the bench, on the, on, in the official's box quite often watching this, and he would take all the questions and answer them Lots of detail, lots of substance, without a single reference to his notes. It was a hugely authoritative performance, and one I must confess, I'd never seen any cabinet minister before or since follow. That's enough from me. One last word of welcome, though, to the next speaker, who is Fred Kemp from uh, the President and Chief Executive of the Atlantic Council. Fred needs little introduction. He's a journalist, an author, a columnist, a regular commentator on TV and radio, both in Europe and in the US, a great friend of this embassy, and a dynamic convener for the council. It's good to see you again, Fred. Over to you. Thank you very much. Um, so, Sir Kim, thank you very much for that. And uh, you can only imagine how proud Christopher would be uh, to, uh, again, have the Christopher Macon's lecture hosted here and hosted uh, by you. Uh, we launched this lecture series in 2005 to honor the memory of the Atlantic Council's former president, Christopher J. Macon's, uh, and to bring together European American thought leaders and policymakers to discuss the current state and future direction of the Atlantic Partnership. Um, of course, we didn't know then how crucial these discussions would still be today, and not since I stepped into this position, now really a dozen years ago, has the Atlantic Council's mission of working together with allies and partners been quite this urgent or quite this important. Uh, our longest serving board director, Henry Kissinger, said recently in an Atlantic Council event, quote, for the first time since the end of the Second World, Second World War, the future relationship of America to the world is not fully settled. Uh, and that really is uh, what our past uh, chairman, Chairman Emeritus Brent Scowcroft said. It's, he has called it a new Atlantic Council founding moment. So in that context, and for the context of the evening, you could also say, paraphrasing Henry Kissinger, for the first time since the end of the Second World War, the future relationship of America to the United Kingdom is also not fully settled. And that uh, will be part of our unique focus this evening. One of the most strategic pillars of the Atlantic Alliance, one near and dear to Christopher Macon's heart given his personal history and lifelong professional interests. Um, through two world wars, the Cold War, and sometimes tumultuous decades have followed, this relationship, sometimes and often referred to as the special relationship, has helped anchor the Atlantic Alliance and defend and advance the principles and institutions of the global post-war order. Today, not only is that order, uh, which the United States and the United Kingdom helped build and lead under severe pressures, but the bilateral relationship itself is also starting to show signs of neglect. Uh, even if our two nations are not in dispute, they are not connecting, uh, in my view, at some of the most fundamental levels uh, as they did in the past. So Christopher would have reminded us not to lose sight of the centrality of the U.S.-U.K. relationship 
even in the midst of Brexit. He would have fought hard to reinvigorate the bilateral relationships, a relationship which both nations will need to rely on to address the pressing global challenges of today and tomorrow. Um, Boyden Gray will have the honor of introducing uh, Sir Malcolm. Uh, he'll also make some personal remarks about Christopher. Uh, but before I pass to Boyden in the great history of the Atlantic Council of Introducers to introduce the introducer, uh, uh, I want to thank Christopher's wife, Wendy, who I'm honored is here with us this evening. Uh, Christopher's life and work and spirit continue to thrive through this lecture series. Uh, I'm also delighted to welcome tonight his daughters, Marion Makins and Tina Cortese. So thank you so much for being here tonight. Uh, I also want to salute Jan Lodel and, of course, always Elizabeth as well. Uh, it was really Christopher and Jan who first talked to me about coming to the Atlantic Council and carried out uh, uh, a recruitment process that was incredibly pleasurable uh, over uh, intermissions of Wagner operas. Uh, intermissions are somewhat shorter than the actual opera. Um, <laughs> Let, let me just say, to date, the Makins Lecture has hosted some of the most prominent, prominent policy influencers of our time. Uh, President Thomas Elvis of Estonia, Zbigniew Brzezinski, uh, President Vyravika Freiberga of Latvia, Dr. Kissinger himself, Lord George Robertson, General Brent Scowcroft. So today I'm greatly honored that we add Sir Malcolm Rifkin to this list of illustrious and committed transatlanticists. So now let me uh, call to the stage and introduce one of the instigators of this lecture series and supporters of it, Ambassador Boyden Gray, to offer a, a couple of his own recollections and introduce uh, tonight's lecturer. Um, Boyden has a storied career in and out of government. Uh, he served as U.S. Ambassador to the European Union, and I know that, uh, it's a position that um, that you have also had in, in, in a, Sir Kim at a previous time as permanent rep to the EU. Uh, he was U.S. Special Envoy to Europe for Eurasian Energy. He also worked in the White House for 12 years, first as counsel to the Vice President during the Reagan administration, then as White House counsel to President George H.W. Bush. Founding partner, Boyden Gray Associates, a law and strategy firm in Washington, D.C. And finally, and most importantly, a guiding force at the Atlantic Council and Vice Chair of our Board, and board of Directors. Boyden, the stage is yours. Well, it is an honor to be an introducer to an introducer, and after having been so well introduced. So, so um, uh, I think that <coughs> uh, we shouldn't forget Christopher, and I'm glad to see that Tina and Marion are here, along with Wendy. Um, he <coughs> was, as, as said earlier, he was, he was British by birth, so we all thought when he first arrived. <clears throat> His father and my father were close friends, and uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't a big surprise to me to learn that he, um, that he uh, would, would, would be in the Foreign Service. Um, but at one point, he fell in love uh, with something in addition to the Foreign Service, which was Wendy, and decided that he did not want to spend the rest of his life traveling around the world uh, dragging Wendy around with him, and that he would stay here with Wendy and continue his work in the think tank world. So this was, this was wonderful. Thank you, Wendy, for, uh, for that. Um, uh, Great Britain's loss, but our gain. Um, he um, did ask me, I'm a lawyer, and, and we, I think our main speaker trained as a lawyer, um, he did ask me if I would help him get U.S. citizenship, which I gladly agreed to do, until one day he let drop totally by accident that he had been born in Southampton, um, New York, uh, during the Blitz, where he'd been sent by uh, his parents. Um, uh, and, and so he was a U.S. citizen. Um, <laughs> I'm glad to report that as greedy as lawyers are, I had not yet sent him a bill for anything. <laughs> uh, but uh, that's how he came to, to, to come here, for those of you who don't know. 
many of us who knew him well, who know him uh, and remember him well, uh, think of him, this is not totally untimely, as the Ayatollah. Now, you may wonder, in what way was he the Ayatollah? Well, he hosted, when he keeps up the tradition, uh, a weekend to open up his house in Maine and would command uh, this wonderful group of friends. And he, he was known to, to this group as the Ayatollah for the way he treated them um, <laughs> uh, to do the chores to clean the house for um, uh, later tenants. He would offset the... the um, the tenor of his, of his um, command by being a great cook. Um, and the thing that he specialized in was breakfast. And within that, it was scrambled eggs, indescribably good scrambled eggs, which he always viewed as simply a vehicle for consuming butter. <laughs> um, he had a... He had a uh, a way of, of, of making fun of everything. He was great, laughter great, joy to be with great spirit, incredibly knowledgeable. I owe my own interest in European affairs to him. He taught me everything I know. He used to love to walk around the house singing, Lloyd George knew my father, father knew Lloyd. You don't want to hear me sing any more of that than that. But that was one of his favorite. Uh, favorite. Um, I, I think of him really uh, most vividly as, as the person who, um, who told me that Adam Smith's first book was not Wealth of Nations, but Theory of Moral Sentiments. And I owe that to Christopher. Um, not surprising that a, Brit a, Brit a British guy would tell an American that, that to be the case, but... That really is important for everyone here to know. Uh, who don't know much about Adam Smith, you should read a little bit about uh, the sequence of the two books. And finally, his great gift, um, apart from his stewardship of the Atlantic Council, his great gift was his successor. So I think we all owe Christopher a real debt, Fred, for, uh, for, your, for your being here. Um, as Fred pointed out, you, you do follow, um, Sir Malcolm, you do follow a, a pretty distinguished group um, of speakers to this lecture series, but I st still think it's a great honor that you do, uh, Christopher and Wendy and the Atlantic Council and all of us, to come and, and, and do this and do this lecture. You've heard enough about um, our speaker. He was Parliamentary and Secretary, Minister of State, uh, Secretary of State for Defense, Foreign Secretary, um, trained as a lawyer, knighted. I don't know what else I can say about him. Written a lot of books. Um, uh, and I can tell you from the, the brief few moments I've had with him, once before and, and just before uh, walking in here, he is uh, a most animated speaker and I'm sure you will enjoy every single word he says. So thank you very much. He will be followed, as you've heard, maybe you haven't heard yet, but there will be a Q&A, which will be run by Mary Jordan. Where, where, where is she? Right here. A Washington Post report, also in the news, not her, her but her, uh, her employer. And she's a Pulitzer Prize-winning uh, author. So you have uh, more in store uh, after the speech. So, Sir Malcolm. Ambassador, I must begin by thanking you and indeed Kim Derrick uh, for your extremely complimentary introductions uh, a few moments ago. It's always nice to be introduced in such a pleasant way. Uh, Lyndon Johnson once remarked in similar circumstances that he had just heard the sort of introduction which his father would have enjoyed and his mother would have believed. <laughs> So I am uh, very grateful to you. Uh, I sadly never had the privilege of meeting Christopher Makins, and indeed, in addition to what I've read about him, what I've heard this evening uh, demonstrates what a remarkable man he clearly was. In addition to the details that have been pointed out, 
I discovered that, of course, he was also elected at an early age as a fellow of All Souls College, uh, Oxford, which itself is a pretty remarkable uh, achievement for anyone in the United Kingdom. Uh, one of the great uh, other aspects of his life is something he shared with Winston Churchill, uh, because in both cases, uh, they had British fathers and American mothers. Uh, and uh, that clearly had a profound influence on his life. So it's a privilege for me both to be in the presence of his family, but also to have the opportunity of giving this uh, lecture. I, uh, when I was Foreign Secretary and in other roles, had, had spent an awful lot of time with ambassadors, and they come in all shapes and sizes. But I have to tell you, one of my favorite ambassadors of all uh, was the United States Ambassador to London, uh, in the 1990s, Admiral Bill Crow, who many of you will know and remember, former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And on one glorious occasion, he was giving a reception at the American Embassy in Grosvenor Square in London, and in those days you could smoke, and he was smoking a cigar. And someone in the, uh, amongst his guests who knew something about cigars sniffed it and reckoned that was a Havana cigar. <laughs> And so he decided to have some fun at the ambassador's expense. He said, Ambassador, you are the American ambassador? You are a former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff? You're smoking a Cuban cigar. You know that's illegal in the United States. Thinking he'd really put him in a corner. Everyone heard what he was saying. And he got the most brilliant reply. The ambassador took another puff of his Havana cigar and said, you know, when I was chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, whenever we sent out men to go into combat, uh, the, what we said to them was, the first thing you do is burn the enemy's crops. <laughs> <laughs> Not a word of further criticism uh, was heard. Now, as you've heard, and some of you will be aware, one of my predecessors uh, was uh, Henry Kissinger in giving this lecture. And uh, when I remember hearing him speak in London. This is very relevant to what I'm about to say this evening. Uh, he addressed the British audience in the late 1980s. And he said, uh, when Adam and Eve left the Garden of Eden never to return, uh, as they were leaving the garden, Adam turned to Eve and said, you know, my dear, we are living in an age of transition. <laughs> <laughs> Now, of course, you know, the obvious point is that every age is an age of transition. But by any standard, what we're going through at the moment is quite extraordinary. My own country, the United Kingdom, in five months' time, after almost half a century, will leave the European Union. The future is not what it used to be. In the United States, you have a president who I think I can safely and diplomatically describe as unique in 250 years of American uh, presidents, with all that is consequential upon that. In China, we have a country that is clearly becoming, if it has not already become, a superpower. Uh, so for 30 years, the United States, which was not just the world's only superpower, but often referred to as a super duper power, uh, now has a serious competitor, uh, which it has not had since the end of the Cold War. And Russia itself, although shrunken compared to the old Soviet Union, uh, Russia, under Putin, whether we like him or loathe him, uh, has emerged from a period of relative impotence in the world and now has a part it is playing. And I'll come to some comments on that later in my remarks. So the first question I ask is, is this extraordinary period we're going through at the moment, is this just some accidental aberration? Or is there some thread, common thread, that if it doesn't explain, certainly contributes to all these various events? And I think to understand better the world we're living in at the moment, you really do have to go back to 1989, uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall and what fl fl flowed from that. And I want to stress, because I think it's highly relevant, that what happened in these extraordinary years was not one event of significance to the world, but three separate events, although they were deeply interconnected. Uh, first of all, there was the end of the Cold War itself, that geopolitical struggle between the Soviet Union and the United States, between the Warsaw Pact and NATO, which, of course, if it had become a hot war, 
would not just have been a third world war, but a thermonuclear war as well, which could have literally destroyed the planet. And so although we live at a time when nuclear weapons are still, and rightly so, a very, very big issue, most of the nuclear threats that we face at the moment are now regional in North Korea, potentially in Iran, India and Pakistan. None of these countries, other than the United States and Russia, have the size of nuclear arsenals that can destroy the planet. So that is something we bear in mind. But it wasn't just a Cold War that came to an end. It was also an ideological war. That's the second of the three things that happened. The battle between communism and capitalism stroke democracy. And communism lost that war because it couldn't deliver. It couldn't meet the aspirations of its own people, never mind those in the wider world. Someone once remarked that communism only works either in heaven where they do not need it or in hell where they have it already. <laughs> I recall hearing, this is probably apocryphal, of a British ambassador who had to make a speech in Moscow during the Soviet period when the Soviet economy was not doing very well. And in his speech in English, which had to be translated into Russian, he used the famous uh, biblical words, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And he heard this was translated into Russian as we have lots of vodka, but we're rather short of meat. <laughs> <laughs> I did say it was apocryphal, so there we are. So that was the second event, the end of the ideological struggle. But it's the third which in some ways has most relevance in terms of our relationship with Mr. Putin today. Because it was also the end of Europe's, or perhaps the world's, last empire, the Russian Empire. The British, the French, all these other empires had gone years before. The Russian was the last to go. And it was a different kind of empire. Because in the case of the United Kingdom or France or Spain or Portugal, uh, our empires were in other parts of the world. And so when we lost them, it had uh, great impact on our prestige. But it didn't uh, make us feel more insecure in our own countries. Uh, Russia's empire had spread out from Russia to cover a vast proportion of the surface of the globe. And somebody summed it up rather well. They said Britain had an empire, Russia was an empire. And when it imploded into no less than 15 countries, 15 new states, that not only ended its superpower status, it took the borders of Russia, the European borders of Russia, back to what they were at the time of Peter the Great in the 1700s. So again, I come to make the point of whatever threats we face from Mr. Putin, they're not comparable to a period during the Cold War when the Soviet Union effectively controlled not just the whole of these, what are now 15 countries, but was also halfway into Western Europe in the middle of Germany, including half of Berlin. So it's a very different situation. And perhaps the most important statement that Mr. Putin has made explaining his own thought processes was before he ever became president, when he said the greatest geopolitical disaster of his lifetime, he said, was the collapse of the Soviet Union. And he didn't mean the Soviet Union. He meant the Russian Empire. And the question has to be, is it not, not that he believes you can resurrect that empire, he's not so foolish, but he does believe that Russia is entitled to exercise ultimate control over the way these former Soviet states, particularly Ukraine, particularly the Baltic states and Georgia, uh, over their future destiny. And that is the fundamental cleavage uh, which we are having to deal with. But it is a relatively, um, not modest is the wrong word, a relatively finite ambition he has compared to the Soviet leadership, which thought it could replace the United States uh, as the global superpower. So we must bear that in mind in deciding how we deal uh, with him. Now let me say, I can't spend an evening nowadays without mentioning Brexit at least once. Yeah. Let me say it's just something about that in the context of what we're discussing this evening and its implications for foreign policy uh, in the years to come. First of all, why is it happening? 
and I'm going to try and be objective. I voted Remain, and I was disappointed with the result, but I wasn't terribly surprised. Uh, when I was Foreign Secretary, Le Monde, the French newspaper, described me as a Eurosceptic moderé. I always liked the moderé. <laughs> but it happened really in a way that is perhaps not sufficiently often mentioned. The decision of a majority of the British public in a very democratic election, referendum, was not because of some outburst of xenophobia or nationalism or nostalgia for the British Empire or isolationism, as you often hear. Nothing to do with any of these in my judgment. It was overwhelmingly a consequence of our historical experience and our geographical reality as an island. And what do I mean by that? I mean this, that the 20th century was a lousy century for most of Europe. Virtu virtually every continental European country went through years and years either of Hitler's Nazi tyranny or Mussolini in Italy or General Franco in Spain or Salazar in Portugal or the Greek colonels in Greece. And in Eastern Europe, all the countries like Poland and the Czechs and the Hungarians and the Baltics were controlled by Stalin and the Soviet tyranny he imposed upon them. And even those that remained democracies like France and the Netherlands spent years during the Second World War occupied, an occupied country that totally had lost the, their liberty. So when the European community, as it then first became, was created, it was partly to ensure that there would never be another war fought in Western Europe, between Western European countries. But it was also to try to ensure that that European community that they were creating uh, adhered to democratic values and the rule of law, which most of these countries either had not had at all or had lost for many years during the 20th century. And it's because of that experience that so many continental Europeans who have mixed feelings about supranationalism, about losing some of their sovereignty, about allowing Brussels to control part of their livelihoods. They put up with that because they can see the obvious huge benefit compared with their own historical experience in the not so distant past. Now people in Britain respect that position, but it's much more difficult to persuade a British audience to come to the same conclusion, and always has been, to come to the same conclusion as continental Europeans. Because Britain has never been invaded since William the Conqueror in 1066, almost literally a thousand years ago. We have never been occupied by a foreign power. And our rule of law and our democratic parliamentary system has been undiminished, uninterfered with since Oliver Cromwell in the 17th century. So from a British uh, perspective, rightly or wrongly, the Brits simply saw or a majority of them certainly saw, the European Union and its growing integration, its single currency, its ending of national borders, decisions taken by majority votes on domestic areas, not just international areas, as not, an, not a way of guaranteeing their freedom, but impinging upon that freedom. Now, enough on the background. What does it mean for foreign policy, given that we're going to soon be no longer a member of the EU? What is the crucial challenge today are for the countries of the European Union and the United Kingdom to work together in order to ensure that Europe speaks as far as possible on foreign policy with a single voice and thereby maximizes its influence. That is what the United States and Russia will notice and China will notice. They don't care about whether Britain's in or not in the European Union in terms of its technical significance or consequences. What they do care about is whether Europe is going to be fragmented on matters that affect the world as a whole. And when Theresa May has said, as she has said several times, that we are leaving the European Union, we're not leaving Europe, that is not just some empty rhetoric. It accurately armaments, heavy, some heavy industry, and not much else. In the 1880s, Tsar Alexander said, Russia has only two friends, its army and its navy. <laughs> uh, more recently, someone said, Russia today has only two friends, its oil and its gas. And in a sense, oil and gas have been as much 
of a uh, burden to Russia as they have been to so many countries in the Middle East because it's given them the illusion that they do not have to create a modern economy. So Russia certainly offers no economic model to countries around the world except as an example of what not to do. But what about China? Because China, we're often told, and China certainly suggests, that in their case, look, they have uh, transformed themselves into a modern economy. They have brought tens of millions, perhaps 100 million Chinese out of poverty uh, into the middle class and, and so forth. And yes, I pay tribute to what they have achieved. It has been a remarkable and impressive achievement. But hold on a moment. Let's get this in perspective. What the Chinese communists have achieved in the last 20 years is what the rest of the Far East achieved 50 years ago. It was only by giving up communism that the Chinese began to catch up on their own neighbors. We've always known that if the Chinese ever had the opportunity, they'd make damn good capitalists. How do we know that? Because you only have to look at Singapore, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Chinese communities, which became hugely more prosperous than China uh, generations ago. So yes, China has achieved an enormous amount, but by giving up the lunacies of Mao Zedong and adopting a form of capitalism with Chinese so-called characteristics. The reason why China makes the impact it does is not because it has some magic formula for economic development. It makes the impact it does for a much more obvious reason. It's got over a billion people, and the sheer size of the country means that an economy that is certainly no more prosperous than Taiwan or South Korea or Japan can nevertheless use the sheer size of its economy to have an impact on global affairs, which smaller countries could not uh, emulate. But China does not offer a model to countries of Asia or Africa or Latin America as to how to escape from poverty into prosperity. The countries that do that, if you're looking to Asia, are, are South Korea, are Taiwan, uh, are Japan, because they have been able to combine economic prosperity with democratic government and with freedom for their own people. So I do not believe there is a threat to the democracy that much of the world currently enjoys. Let me conclude by referring to the second threat I mentioned, which was the threat to our liberal values, which I said was an internal threat. And it is an internal threat not just in uh, Hungary or Poland, but as we are all well aware, within the United States over the last couple of years, many fear the erosion of freedom, but even in the United Kingdom, we have also had situations where judges have been viciously attacked both in the press and by some politicians because they dared to give rulings which the government of the day might have disapproved of. I think we have to be very careful that that does not increasingly replace the tolerance that is so important. You know, the United Kingdom in one respect is a very unusual country. I mentioned earlier that many immature democracies don't respect the rights of the minority of the population who didn't vote for them. For the last 200 years, we have called the opponents of the government Her Majesty's opposition. In other words, they are as legitimate a part of our constitution as the government itself. Her Majesty's opposition it sounds ridiculous, it sounds contradictory, and yet we know what it means. And we also recognized the need for a majority to respect a minority, even when it's in power, by the solution that was developed for the troubles of Northern Ireland. Where however democratic Northern Ireland was, the Catholic minority could never win an election because they were a minority and people voted on a sectarian basis. And so we said in that one part of the United Kingdom alone, 
there will be institutionalized power sharing where you have to have, to have a coalition uh, whenever a government uh, takes power. So I think these factors are highly relevant. The final point I want to make is about the rule of law. And it's in some ways the most important of all the concepts that have developed in America and Britain and in the West over the last uh, 200 years. I rec we all know what the rule of law means. I don't have to tell this audience what its crucial ingredients are, the independence of the judiciary and, and so forth. But I remember visiting China as foreign secretary in the final stage of Hong Kong returning to China. And the people in Hong Kong who I'd met before I went to Beijing said, when you see the Chinese foreign minister, will you please ask him whether the rule of law in Hong Kong will continue to be enjoyed? So I promised I would. And when I spoke to the Chinese foreign minister, I said this to him. And he said, oh, don't worry, Mr. Rifkind. I never forgotten his reply. He said, don't worry. We in China, we too believe in the rule of law. In China, the people must obey the law. <laughs> and I said, now hold on a moment. Hold on a moment. When we talk about the rule of law, it's not just the people who must obey the law. It's the government must obey the law. The government must be under the law. The government must respect if the court, the Supreme Court or whoever it is, says you're acting contrary to the law, the government must not only uh, acknowledge that, but agree to change its practices in order to conform with the legal requirements. He not only didn't agree with what I was saying, he hadn't actually the faintest idea what I was saying. <laughs> it was a concept he could not comprehend, that a government should be able to be instructed what to do by people who were not elected, who were not politicians, but were judges. Uh, it has been summed up rather well. In China and in Mr. Putin's Russia, they don't have the rule of law, they have rule by law. And you use the legal system to actually try to control the population, to protect your own power base, and make political opposition illegal and therefore, in their twisted logic, thereby justifying incarcerating your enemies. So I conclude by simply saying that we have a great obligation, particularly the United States and the United Kingdom. Why these two countries? Because of Magna Carta. Because Magna Carta uh, was a concept, uh, was an event which happened in England, but which is as important to the American Constitution as it is to the United Kingdom. And remember something crucial about Magna Carta because of the century in which it, 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 it occurred. It's got very little to do with democracy. What it has everything to do with is the rule of law. It wasn't about creating democratic government. It was about ensuring that those who have power are subordinate to the law. And so we have to try to remember that the best way we can persuade other countries around the world to give that priority to the rule of law that it deserves is to recognize that it's not inviolate in the United Kingdom or in the United States. People nibble at the edges. Presidents resent when they're told by the Supreme Court. British prime ministers no doubt object if our courts sometimes indicate that some law is no longer as valid as we thought it was. So we have to show that we practice what we preach. And in doing so, we will not only safeguard our own people's liberty, but we will be able to demonstrate, not just in Asia and Africa and Latin America, but in Beijing and Moscow, that what they choose to call Western values are truly universal values. Thank you very much indeed. Fabulous. Thank you so much. Um, we might as well start with news since uh, you know, one of your many uh, fancy titles is uh, that you are the chairman of the Intelligence and Security Committee, and 
in Parliament until quite recently, for a long time. So you know what's going on in the intelligence world. And um, there's an enormous amount of interest about what's going on in Saudi Arabia. And the big question remaining is, do you think, or do, do we think, uh, that, that Mohammed bin Salman ordered that hit? Saudi Arabia is going through the biggest crisis of its history. Whoever expected the Saudi government, albeit grudgingly and after several weeks, first of all to admit that Khashoggi sadly was in their consulate, started by saying he accidentally died because of some brawl, and then in the last 48 hours admitted he'd been murdered as a deliberate act of the people who had control of him. It's rather like Putin suddenly. Oh, we're going to get to him. Well, I know, but so. it's right, <laughs> But we've had, you know, he too was trying to murder people, in, in that case in, in, in Salisbury in, in, in England. And there's not much chance of Putin saying, put my hands up, it was me all along. So. Do, do you think it was I, Putin? Of course it was Putin. Of course, he's an ex KGB man. He, he wanted intelligence, his guys, to bump off all his enemies. And I'm not the slightest doubt. We now know it was, because we've had that ludicrous uh, television uh, interview given by the two men who tried to kill uh, Mr. Skripal uh, when they said they were really just harmless tourists wandering around looking at cathedral spires, which didn't sound very convincing even in Moscow. Now, in 2000... So I haven't answered your question, though. Okay. Uh, your original question about yes. Saudi Arabia. So the point I'm, I'll come to, and I'll come to it quickly, is that... The only thing left to find out in, Saudi, in the Saudi case is whether the guys who killed Khashoggi were instructed to by the crown prince, or if they weren't instructed to by him, knew that that's what he wanted them to do. What do you think? It's very difficult to believe otherwise, because that we know for certain that the people who did the murder were not just uh, Saudi nationals, they, were, they included people, very senior people, who were part of the Crown Prince's entourage. Because we know their names, we know what they look like, and it's been identified that at least three or four of them were amongst either his bodyguards or his closest intelligence advisors. And that means they were either instructed by him to do this, or if they weren't instructed, they assumed that that was what they had authority to do because of earlier conversations of some form of So fashion. what do you think the consequence of this will be? It's clear American intelligence thinks that he, that he was right there in the middle. It sounds like British intelligence may think that well, too. Well, remember, he is, a, he is the crown prince. He's not the king. The king's his father. Um, and the, the issue of Saudi Arabian monarchy is that it's not simply one man. It's a clan. It's a family. Uh, no, there are several hundred princes, but there is a couple of dozen of the really important ones. And if they conclude that the crown prince is irreversibly now a liability, not an asset, there will be intense pressure on the king to get a new crown prince. He's already... The present crown prince was not the first one. He was the result of a previous change that the current king announced a couple of years ago. And it's very sad in many ways, because some of the things the crown prince has done uh, we've all welcomed in terms of uh, women being allowed to drive in Saudi Arabia, the cinemas being opened, the possibility of a more tolerant form of Islam evolving. That all sounded good. But he's also done some very thuggish things and stupid things, uh, like the, the, the uh, uh, war in Yemen, uh, like the attempt to destroy Qatar, uh, and various other things of that kind. There's a lot of talk about the older guard getting, you know, wanting to replace him. Do you have any sense of what direction Saudi Arabia would go with the next up, if there is indeed a next up after it, it, it is in, impossible to, to give any firm answer to that because the Saudis themselves don't know. Uh, what we do know is you cannot go from the absolute monarchy that Saudi Arabia is and has always been to some sort of democratic <laughs> rule of law, liberal system. It's simply not possible. What one hopes for is, and what one hoped one might have had with Mohammed bin Salman, uh, was someone who was both popular in Saudi Arabia, had a reformist uh, 
intent and over a number of years could gradually change Saudi Arabia towards some form of constitutional monarchy. Now, that's going to be much more difficult now. But the alternative of allowing this guy to remain as crown prince and then become king, unless some miracle happens, that could be even worse. Well, let's, let's stay on this same horrible theme of, of world leaders who don't like critics and are, are getting more and more bold about what to do with them. And you were saying in Putin in Salisbury earlier this year. What, how, what is the recourse for that? And how does U.S. help well, you, in any way? You know, what's happened in the Saudi case, I'm sorry to come back to it, but it's a very, it has wider implications. It's actually hugely encouraging. You know, in the current climate, we could have all seen a situation where uh, a Saudi journalist gets murdered in a consulate in Istanbul, and people say, well, you know, compared with what's happening around the world, big deal. And the headlines then move on to some other story a few days later. That's not happening. Uh, pretty well, there was a universal assumption that leaders in the whole spectrum of countries had to emphasize their revulsion in no uncertain terms. I mean, President Trump, who has not normally identified as somebody who cares a lot about human rights, and certainly not human rights in other countries. No, no, it's a serious point, actually. I'm not just trying to have a go at him. You know, that's his reputation, fair or unfair. Uh, yet he has felt obliged to reassure the American public that he is as revolted by this and is determined to find out the truth as anybody else. Now, whether he actually believes that or not, I do not know. But the fact is he feels that American public opinion requires him, expects him, to react the way he has done. And I'm sure he's right. That is what the public opinion has done. And it's not just that this guy was killed. It's the, the way the, it appears to have all happened in a particularly revolting and... and uh, Put the music fashion. on while I take the saw. Huh? Put the music on while I take the saw. Well, out. that's just one example. Kind of but the whole, the whole thing is so bad. But is it just it, uh, words? Um, I mean, you were saying it's encouraging because there's been a lot of words. It's very interesting what Turkey is doing, for sure. Without that video, it's unclear, you know, even what kind of response there would have been. And Turkey's been obviously key in all this. But again, what it'll be interesting, and in cases like this, what is the special relationship? And how do, how do Britain and Washington um, work together? OK. Um, the crucial thing to remember about what is off I, I, I try not to use that term. I think it's so hackneyed, the special relationship. But uh, the crucial thing to remember is that it has never in the last 60, 70 years, meant that the United Kingdom and the United States must always agree with each other. Uh, if you look back, Churchill had many disagreements with Roosevelt. Uh, Harold Wilson refused to send troops to Vietnam, uh, despite uh, the American president, Lyndon Johnson, and, and others uh, trying to persuade him to do so. Uh, Bill Clinton and, uh, Mar and uh, John Major disagreed on Bosnia. Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan often disagreed. Um, so when you have mature democracies occasionally disagreeing, uh, then that does not damage or destroy the friendship or the mutual interest. I remember, if I may be allowed to give this example, um, during uh, the Reagan-Thatcher period, uh, when the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan, uh, America not only imposed sanctions on the Soviet Union, but threatened that if any European companies uh, did trade contracts with uh, the Soviet Union, uh, their countries would be subject to sanctions. And in the case of the United Kingdom, we had a company, John Brown Engineering, which had a major contract on a Soviet pipeline. And Britain was being threatened with sanctions by its oldest friend and ally. And Margaret Thatcher went ballistic. She, uh, she went on in public uh, on the BBC saying, who does the United States think they are trying to tell us who we should trade with? We'll decide whether we trade with the Soviet Union or not. And then I was the junior minister at the time in the Foreign Office, the deputy uh, the minister of state. And I was sent off to Washington. I came to Washington. 
uh, to have talks with the American Deputy Secretary of State, uh, Kenneth Dam. Many of you will remember him. And we had talks, and we produced some sort of compromise. Uh, the only thing we couldn't agree on was whether the compromise should be known as the Rifkin Dam Agreement or the Dam Rifkin Agreement. <laughs> Very so, good. so these disputes happen from time but to time. Let's go back to Putin for a second. Uh, if you were there in the room with Maggie Thatcher and Gorbachev, right? I was in the room with Margaret Thatcher and, when, and Gorbachev. And she famously said, Gorbachev's the guy we can do business with. Correct. If Maggie Thatcher were in the room with Putin, what would she say about him? At the moment, she'd say he's the man with whom we can't do business for the time being. Uh, no, I mean, it's worth, if I may make a serious point, uh, the Thatcher-Gorbachev thing was extraordinary. When she said that he's a man with whom we can do business, and that's why Ronald Reagan, you know, if, she, if anybody else had said it, he would have thought this is naive. But for the Iron Lady to say it, he sat up and said, well, this is worth thinking about. Now, what's important to bear in mind is that although <laughs> Thatcher and Gorbachev got on so well, they didn't reach agreement on a single thing. Uh, after two or three rounds of discussions, they, you know, he was still a convinced communist, and she was the Iron Lady. But what had happened was two things. First of all, they quite liked each other because they were naturally curious and willing to have open discussion. And they began to understand where each was coming from. But even more important, arising out of what I've just said, there began to be a, a, a relationship of trust. And trust is crucial because you can make huge progress on nuclear weapons, on foreign policy issues, on all sorts of things, not just by getting agreement. Sometimes agreement may be very difficult. But if you trust each other, you can start searching for but common right ground. But right now, there is no forward. trust with Putin. That is right. right. OK. And, and, so and he doesn't trust us either. And, and when I was in London in 2006, um, Latvininko was, was poisoned. Yes. 2006, so, so this year it happened again. So uh, what, how does this play out, and how did the US response to what happened in Salisbury this year under the Trump administration differ, if you have any idea, than it did in 2006? No, no, the, the, I wouldn't use the, either the Litvinenko case or the Salisbury poisoning as part of the wider uh, reasons uh, for um, a very bad relationship. Of course, it's relevant, but it's relatively, uh, an inc these are incidents rather than the fundamental cause of the problem. The fundamental cause of the problem is that the present Russian government cannot accept the independence of Ukraine, and to a lesser extent, it doesn't really accept the independence of the Baltic states, uh, and is trying to not reverse all the collapse of the Soviet Union, but to be able to be the ultimate uh, determinant uh, of these countries' political destiny. And the West, quite rightly, says that is unacceptable. When the Russians annexed Crimea, on ethnic grounds, they annexed Crimea because they said they had to protect the Russian majority that lived in Crimea. The last time something like that happened was when Hitler annexed the Sudetenland on the grounds that the uh, Germans in the Sudetenland of Czechoslovakia had to be protected. It was bogus then, and it's bogus now. I'm not saying Putin is another Hitler. He's not. Uh, Putin's an opportunist, not a megalomaniac. But in this particular respect, the annexation of Crimea was a terrible setback uh, for the stability of Europe and of the wider world. Well, let me just state on the US-UK relationship. I just wondered that there's enormous amount of talk in this country about the Trump administration's uh, relationship with Russia. So how does that play out when something like what happened in Salisbury happens? How does the U well, does it, is there any different response than there might have been before Donald Trump no, was no, in office? No, well, the, the, the irony is, of course, that the Trump administration have a worse relationship with Putin than the Obama administration had. Not because Trump wanted that, uh, but because, first of all, the controversy about whether the Russians were interfering with the presidential election has created such a issue uh, that has prevented Trump doing what he might have liked to have done, uh, which is to have cultivated uh, a new relationship with Putin and make sacrifices in Ukraine or elsewhere uh, 
in order to curry favor. He's not been able to do that. But he's also not been able to do it because the one issue in which the Congress, the Republicans in Congress, particularly in the Senate, have refused to follow Trump is on anything that might weaken NATO uh, or that might give comfort uh, to Moscow. On so many other issues, both domestic policy and to some extent trade and foreign policy, most Republicans in Congress, with varying degrees of enthusiasm, have gone along with the Trump uh, policy. Uh, Trump knows that on NATO and on Russia policy, it's the other way around. Congress has actually passed new sanctions on Russia, which uh, Trump has been required to swallow. So uh, uh, poor Mr. Putin, having put so much investment in trying to get Mr. Trump elected, must be very, very disappointed. <laughs> Uh, and I hear you won't be going to Moscow anytime soon. I'm banned by Mr. Putin from going to <laughs> Moscow because I, I was one of those who supported financial and banking sanctions uh, because of the annexation of Crimea. Uh, amongst the, there was about 50 of us who were banned in various parts of Europe and perhaps America, I'm not certain. One was the former uh, Czech foreign minister, Mr. Karol Schwarzenberg, uh, who was, is a great old bohemian aristocrat uh, uh, very anti-communist, and who ended up as foreign minister of the Czech Republic. When he was told that, along with me and others, he'd been banned, he was asked, what is your reaction? And Mr. Schwarzenberg said, well, the first thing I did was to see who else has been banned, and I see I'm a member of a very decent club. <laughs> there we go. Let's go back to Brexit for you a second. You have to be a bohemian aristocrat <laughs> to make that uh, particular observation. Yeah. There were hundreds of thousands of people in the streets just a few days ago, again, about Brexit. People, many people want a new vote. And it you said there were 700,000, which leaves 64 million who weren't. <laughs> if there were a new vote, how do you think it would go? Well, I, I said earlier that I'd voted to remain, not to leave the European Union. If there was another referendum, I might vote to leave. Because I think the idea of another referendum would be a... You just like to be contrary. So, no, it's not, yeah. well, I do, but not, that's not the real reason. No, it's, it's, not, it's not that. You know, whatever you think of uh, the arguments for or arguments against leaving the European Union, what the United Kingdom had was a massive expression of genuine democracy. Here you had a fundamental issue, and instead of the politicians deciding it, uh, the public uh, took that decision. All the political parties not just the Conservative Party, said we will respect the decision of the but electorate. But your vote, if it were held, were, were just in honor of the last vote. Whole, is that no, what no, you're no, saying? No, no, no. What I was about to say was, if you have another uh, referendum, there's only two things that will happen. We will either spend a whole year and get exactly the same result as we got last time, in which case, a uh, terrible waste of time, or if uh, you had 51% uh, say remain and 49% say, leave, do you think that would be the end of the debate? Uh, in fact, all that would happen is a deep, deep, permanent bitterness that having won a referendum, we were then forced into a second one which that side lost. And they'll say, well, there will have to be a third one. You know? And what would happen is that my party, the Conservative Party, would be completely taken over by those saying, if we come back to power, we will have a third referendum to leave once and for all. And so it would go on and on. It's what in Canada, when they had this problem in Quebec, they called several referendums. They said it's better described as never end them. <laughs> and has, has this just kind of squashed Scottish independence? Well, that's the other point. You see, we had an, we've had two referendums, one on Brexit and the other on Scottish independence. And there, there we got the result that I personally was delighted with. Uh, I'm Scottish myself, uh, with a, a substantial majority that said, no, we want to remain part of the United Kingdom. Now, that has led to the Scottish nationalists uh, at our last general election, for the first time for 25 years, losing very substantial support in Parliament. Compare that to Catalonia, where the Spanish government said, you can't have a referendum, we don't believe in referendums, you are going to stay part of Spain whether you like it or not. And Catalonia and Spain are still in crisis. And one day, the Spanish government will have to climb down because you can't choose, decide every issue by a general election. How could you decide Scottish independence by a general election when 90% of the electorate don't live in Scotland? And therefore, you know, they would be the people who decided the outcome. And the same on Brexit. Uh, 
How can you decide it by a general election when each of the main parties are divided between those who want to leave and those who want to stay? A general election doesn't resolve that. So that's when referendums make sense. So I'm going to ask one more question, then we're going to go to the audience. So be thinking, and then I'll call on you. But so with, there's been a lot of talk that Brexit has, you know, diminished uh, geopolitical clout. Is there some silver lining in this for for <laughs> the relationship? Well, I, we I won't be, call it special, but between the sure. UK and Washington. I, I, I would be a little bit cautious about deciding now what the long-term effects of Brexit will be on Britain's international role. Uh, this audience in particular might be interested that way back in the 1780s and 90s, when you won a certain war of independence uh, from the United Kingdom and we lost our control of the American colonies, uh, the then emperor of Austria uh, said, uh, England is now irreversibly a second-rate power, rather like Sweden and Denmark, and will remain so. It was a rather premature judgment, <laughs> as it turned out. And actually, it was Austria itself which ended up as the second-rate power, but, uh, uh, rather than the United let's, Kingdom. Let's talk about intelligence services, right? So Britain is used as a door into Europe. Right? In many ways, they know everything that's going on in Europe, so when you're talking the intelligence world... In that case, we'll still know, even uh, after we've left. So do, will you still know? Will there be the same sharing? You, you, like you said, you're still part of Europe, you're not the European Union, but there's a lot of people that think that, that maybe that there won't be as much sharing. No, no. There, 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 will, there will be at least as much sharing, uh, not because people like Britain, it's because of mutual interest. Uh, you know, the, one of the big issues in Europe, as everyone knows, is international terrorism. You can only deal with international terrorism by an international response. You can only have an international response if you share intelligence in a very intimate way. Now, our most intimate intelligence relationship is what's called Five Eyes, the United States, Britain, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. That's been running for 50, 60 years. But we also have excellent bilateral intelligence relationships with France, so you don't see it changing Germany. much? No, no. And, and just one final point on intelligence, if I may. <laughs> uh, I remember the very first time I was in uh, uh, the CIA, at the end of a meeting with Liam Panetta. Just physically? Uh, you weren't you know, the first time part I was, of the CIA? No, no I wasn't, in the, I wasn't yeah. a member of the CIA. <laughs> I, I, Madeleine Albright, who I worked with and is a good friend of mine, took me to a meeting in the, in the, with uh, Leon Panetta when he was director of the CIA. And anyway, I just wanted to amuse the audience here by saying as I was leaving the building, I was given a CIA coffee mug, one of these ornate with a, you know, the CIA insignia all around it as a memento. And I looked at it and admired it, and I happened to turn it upside down, and guess what it said? Made, made in, in China. China. Yeah, <laughs> exactly right, made in China. So I turned to the CIA guy with me. I said, I hope that's Taiwan. He said, we don't know. <laughs> and that mug is now sitting on my desk in my study at home, and the Chinese have probably been listening to me for the last 20 years. Very good. All right, let's, I think there's a mic, is there a microphone? Yes, so. One over here. Sure. Thank you very much. Uh, should I introduce myself? Or? Yes. Okay. I'm Matteo Miroler from Stanford University. Um, one of the things you, you said uh, on your description of European domestic politics uh, really made me think of this question that I hear a lot in the streets of Europe. What is democracy? Um, it's all fake. You know, things like that, which sometimes is candid, but most often malicious. And I should add that even at Cambridge University, where I studied, uh, the demo critics, as we could call them, are many, even if they still hide for now. So whilst I appreciated your uh, realist um, description of the problem at hand, I was wondering whether it should not be also associated to a more ideological or maybe emotional uh, reading. In other words, do you think that this, what you called um, the internal threat to liberal values could also be described as the birth of a new ideology. Thank you very much. Right, I think we can spend a huge amount of time trying to define terms, but you know, I'd go for a more simple approach. Uh, democracy, I'm, when I call a country democratic, I'm just meaning one thing basically. Are it, its people 
able to remove a government they have lost faith in peacefully by the ballot and the people in power respect that decision and leave power. If that happens, then they are a democracy. Liberal values uh, is more complex because it means a, a, a combination of things, but it's primarily the rule of law and respect for minorities in various ways. Um, and minorities doesn't just, it means, includes migrants or refugees, but it also means people who just have different opinions, who don't go along with the majority on whatever issue. Now, I, I don't think that's, uh, we're dealing with an alternative ideology, because I don't think anybody has yet produced an, ide an illiberal ideology. It's just people who are themselves authoritarian or would like to be dictators, uh, wanting to persuade a gullible public that this somehow would be in their interest to move in that direction. And it's also partly because the Democratic parties sometimes lose touch uh, with sections of the electorate who become progressively disillusioned. And you know, if you respect the electorate, they respect the politician more than if you don't. And let me just give one example, very brief one. You have heard how in many countries the traditional parties have collapsed. In France, for example, Macron won because he invented a new party which swept him to power. That's what's happened in Italy as well with the Northern League and the Five Star Movement. And, and you've got the AFD in Germany and, and so forth and so on. In Britain, it's gone the other way around. We had UKIP, which was our nearest thing to an extremist party, with several million votes. They've disappeared. Why have they disappeared? Because when we had our referendum on Brexit, the politicians had promised they would respect the decision of the electorate, and to the electorate's amazement, the politicians did. All the political leaders said, we are leaving the European Union, because that's the way you voted. And two million people who had voted for UKIP said, well, we don't need to vote for UKIP anymore. And UKIP collapsed. It now doesn't have a single MP. It didn't have many to start off with, but it, it had lots of councillors. It has one local councillor in the whole of Britain elected at the last local elections. So there are ways of getting rid of these extremists or uh, odd parties or whatever, but it, the, the traditional parties, if they want to get that respect, have to earn it. What about extremists in mainline parties? Well, if sensible parties, I mean, the, the tragedy of our Labour Party uh, is that it's been taken over by the hard <laughs> left because many people who were not members of the Labour Party, because they were communist or Marxist or in other ways had hardline ideological views, uh, so approve of Mr. Corbyn that he's joined that party. Now, uh, obviously, we it's too early to predict exactly what will happen at our next general election. But uh, what the opinion polls are saying, even at this moment, is the Labour Party has been unable, under Corbyn, to lead the Conservatives in popular support. And if they can't do that, in the middle of a very difficult period for the Conservative government, that to me suggests the prospects of winning a general election are pretty poor. Very good. Okay. Fran Burwell from the Council. Um, I very much agree with what you said about the importance of the EU 27 and the UK acting together in foreign and security policy post Brexit. But I'm very concerned that what seems to me the um, increasing likelihood of a no-deal Brexit may poison relations and the impetus to set up some kind of security, defense, anti-terrorist partnership. What do you think are the, is the likelihood of no-deal? And if you think it's not going to happen, do you have a solution for the Irish border issue? Okay, Theresa May reported to Parliament today and she said, uh, we actually have now got 95% of a deal. And that's pretty good. And, and, and I can go through the details of what makes up that 95%. And she's right. We've got 95% of a deal. There's only one thing outstanding of a really difficult kind, and it's a point you've just raised, about what happens at the Irish border. Do we have what's called a hard border or a soft border in terms of trade between these two parts of Ireland? Now, I think the drama about Ireland has been grossly exaggerated. 
Why do I say that? First of all, the United Kingdom and the Republic of Ireland are in total agreement that neither side wants what's called a hard border. What do we mean by a hard border? We mean fences and barriers and barbed wire, long queues and visas and all that sort of stuff. Nobody wants that. So if nobody wants that, it's pretty unlikely that that's what we're going to end up with. The Irish government have been insisting that we have to have something written into an agreement that guarantees that can never happen. Now, the best way that that will never happen is if we achieve what is one of our main negotiating objectives, which is over the next two or three years to negotiate what can best be described as a free trade agreement with the EU. If we have a free trade agreement, then the problem resolves itself for Britain and Ireland as a whole. There isn't a Northern Ireland problem. So the issue is about what is called a backstop. What happens if these negotiations don't succeed? Now, we are told at the moment 27 countries are insisting on X, Y, Z, uh, as if somehow all these 27 countries are passionately interested about what happens in Northern Ireland. I mean, that's absurd. I mean, the idea that in Lisbon, in Athens, in Berlin, uh, in Paris, they spend their time talking about the Northern Irish border uh, is ridiculous. There's only two countries that are worried about that issue. One is the United Kingdom, and the other is the Republic of Ireland. And if we had no deal, what that would mean is, I mean, if it was, if it, is you'd have a hard border next May. So the Irish, at the end of the day, cannot uh, insist on no deal because the Brits refuse to uh, sign certain dots and T's uh, because uh, the consequence of no deal would be even worse from their point of view. Winston Churchill once said in politics, you shouldn't commit suicide because you might live to regret it. <laughs> Is there, okay, here we go. Thank you, Paula Stern with the Atlantic Council as well. Uh, thank you for your presentation. It was very, very interesting. A um, lot for us to think about. Um, Last week, uh, the president's trade representative of the U.S. Um, sent a request to the Congress um, to uh, uh, get the authority to negotiate uh, with the U.K. on trade. Um, my question is um, really what do you believe the U.K. would like to see in a trade agreement with the United States, a bilateral agreement. And if I might um, add to the question, um, how important is it to the UK um, that the World Trade Organization um, be functional going forward, given the fact that we're having these series of bilaterals mm -hmm. starting off with possibly UK, the US? OK, that's a very, very crucial question. Let me give you a straightforward answer. Uh, first of all, there are quite important historic differences between Britain and the United States on trade, uh, not just under Trump, but even under previous presidents. The United States, from time to time, uh, goes in for protectionist measures, and either tariffs or threats of tariffs uh, as being aware, partly because of the size of the American economy. It's got a lot of leverage, and it likes to use it but partly also because America has had phases in its history when it's been quite isolationist and not particularly liked the idea of international organizations. In the United Kingdom, not only do we believe in free trade, we don't even debate it anymore because there is no dispute about that from the hard right to the hard left. Uh, we, we, we have not had any controversy in the United Kingdom with people saying we want protectionism or tariffs or whatever uh, for almost exactly 100 years, since the 1920s, was the last attempt at what was then called imperial preference, and which never actually happened in any meaningful way. So the Brits approach all these trade issues, very strong believers in the WTO, very strong believers in international trade. Um, I, when I was foreign secretary, I, along with one or two others, called for a, a Nor uh, an Atlantic free trade area, between the United States and Canada and the European Union, including the United Kingdom. 
And that still is something I hope one day might happen. Now, your current president doesn't believe in multilateral trade. He believes in a series of bilateral trade agreements. OK, well, at this particular moment in our history, because we're leaving the EU, we would like to have a bilateral agreement, not just with the United States, but with Japan, with China, with a whole series of countries. Uh, I am, in terms of my own personal view, I'm all in favor of these negotiations going ahead. I don't believe that they are more important than getting a decent trade agreement with the EU, simply because at the moment, 40% of our trade is with the European Union, much more than with the United States, and you don't give up 40% of trade in order to expand trade with other countries, however welcome that might be. Ideally, we will hope to get both, uh, to have good trading relations with the United States, improved compared to where we are at the moment, uh, but also preserve as much as we can of our existing markets with uh, continental Europe. Continental Europe has a trade surplus with the United Kingdom in, in goods. We have a surplus in financial services. So there's a, there is leverage in both ways uh, when we come to pure trading questions. Well, we have run out of time. Um, so let's just end with this and then you'll be here and, and you can come up and talk to him. But just since we're in this storied residence and you've talked about um, the long view of the UK-US relationship. Uh, let's talk about what it looks like and will it be in any significant way different 10 years from now. Presumably, the current leaders of the two countries will not be there, at least on this side, unless laws change, it's not gonna happen. But is there, 10 years from now, will there be a significant difference in the UK-US relationship? Well, I think the crucial question that will, will provide the answer to what you've raised uh, is, uh, until now, part of the value of the US-UK relationship has been our role in the European Union, that we have been able to influence European Union decisions from the inside and because our views tend to be closer to America's than many other European countries, that has served the interests of the United States. So some say by leaving the European Union, uh, the Americans will be less interested in the United Kingdom. To some extent, there may be some truth in that, but you have to balance against that other considerations, uh, that the United Kingdom remains the country with the largest defense budget in, in Europe. The most, uh, Britain and France are the two serious military capability countries in, uh, in, in Europe. The United Kingdom's budget is the highest. We are a permanent member of the Security Council. We are a nuclear weapon state. We have the fifth or sixth largest economy in the world. Uh, and we have, through the English language and the Commonwealth, uh, we have global links. Uh, with about a quarter to a third of the world's countries. So these are huge assets for the United Kingdom, but they're also huge assets for the United States and for other Western democracies who work with the United Kingdom. Now, just a final point I wanted to make, um, and it touches on what I tried to say earlier. Whatever our disagreements in the current negotiations over Brexit, there is no threat to France, to Britain, or to Germany of a, a geopolitical kind that would not also be a threat to the other two countries. You know, it's a function of geography. Uh, so the question is, can we now create some new structure, which I would loosely call EU plus one, uh, for major foreign policy issues so we can speak with a common voice? And there are good precedents for this. For example, when the Iran negotiations um, were taking place, uh, these, the responsibility was given to the P5, the five permanent members of the Security Council. But somebody said, now wait a moment, they're much more likely to succeed with Iran if Germany is included, because of Germany's importance economically and politically and so forth. And, but she wasn't a member of the Security Council, permanent member of the Security Council. So for the purpose of these negotiations, they created the P5 plus one. You find a solution and you resolve the problem in that way. 
Let me give a final example, very good example, I think. Uh, France almost uh, uh, left NATO under General de Gaulle. Uh, many of you will recall that de Gaulle announced that it was unacceptable to the sovereignty of France uh, that its armed forces in peacetime should come under an American saqueur, supreme allied commander. This was unacceptable. Now, under the rules of NATO at that time, uh, France should have had to have left NATO. And what in practice happened is the Americans, the British, the Germans all said, this is nuts. Uh, we know basically our interests on the fundamental issues are with France have not d disappeared. We must find a solution to this issue. And so what happened was uh, that France did leave the integrated military structure of NATO, but was permitted to remain a member in order that we could get the benefit of its weight, of its relevance, of its military capability, if ever there was a real crisis with the Soviet Union. So I conclude by saying, and it describes the European Union perfectly, when you're looking for solutions, you find solutions. When you're looking for problems, you find problems. And 10 years from now, a lot of invitations with plus one? I think that what will happen, and I've had a lot of private discussions with French and German uh, senior political people who I know quite well, uh, they will not publicly say this until the Brexit, the more economic negotiations are complete, but they recognize that, uh, not that they couldn't survive without the United Kingdom, but that when you are speaking to China, to America, uh, to the rest of the world, the more Europe can speak on foreign geopolitical issues with a single voice, the more likely Europe is to be heard. And therefore, EU plus one makes a lot of sense, not every day of the week, but when the big issues, future of the Middle East, Russia policy, China policy, North Korea, uh, Saudi Arabia, on these issues, that's when it actually makes a, a, a big difference. Just final example of that, if you think of the sanctions against Russia, which were decided by the EU, which has remained unanimous in imposing them, <coughs> financial and banking sanctions, which are the sanctions that Putin hates most, would have had no validity if the United Kingdom had not been involved, because our financial sector is the strongest in Europe. City of London and New York are the two global financial centers. Well, thank you very, very much. <laughs>